Sometimes you're like, I'm not scanning something, you know, whatever. Um, but it's going to take you to a landing page on our website that just gives you some information about uh, who we are, what we do, some things that we'd love to be able to help you with along your journey. Uh, you can find all that information there. There's also a spot there where you can fill out a connect card because we'd love, we love that you're here, but we would also love to get to know you and be able to connect with you. So if you're interested in that, you can do that. The other way that you can uh, connect with us is out in the lobby here in person. There is a green wall that says welcome or something like that. We call that our welcome center. Uh, you can go over there. They've got a free gift for first time guests. So if you're new, we'd love to do that uh, for you today and give you something to just say thanks for worshiping with us today. Well, if you came today prepared to give on your way out, there will be people at the doors uh, with offering bags if you wanna give that way. If you would rather give a different way, there's multiple ways to give here. You can give online, you can give through our app, you can mail a check, whatever's easiest for you. Uh, but I wanna say two things. One, thank you so much for those of you that since January, since we did our first Things First series, uh, we have had uh, just amazing giving, really have. And uh, it's been a huge uh, blessing to, to be able to be where we are financially with all of that. So thank you to those who are giving. Uh, the second thing would be, if you're not giving, I would just challenge you to start. Um, God was the one who said, test me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you, will have, you won't have room enough for it. Jesus said, give and it will be given unto you. And your harvest is in direct uh, uh, relation to the amount of seed that you sow. So if you haven't given anything, you're not gonna receive God's blessing. But when you do, God multiplies it and does things that are unbelievable. And I know personally uh, just the blessings that God has put in my life because of giving or through giving, and uh, I want that for you. So if you haven't started, I'd love for you to start. There's multiple ways that you can do that. Well, we're really excited for next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday is Pentecost, and on Pentecost Sunday, we're doing what we're having, or we're having uh, a baptism celebration. I believe that we're somewhere nine or 10 people already signed up to get baptized next Sunday. If you've never been baptized before, or if you're interested in being baptized, there's a QR code that you can see on the screen. You can scan that. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Um, baptism is such an awesome way for us to unite ourselves with Christ, to show the world that we are joining with him. It's how we go public with our faith and be united with his death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, next week's gonna be an awesome week. Uh, Pentecost is like the birthday of the church, right? Um, so we've been on this 40-day journey. So Jesus resurrected on Easter Sunday. 40 days was his ascension. We celebrated that with a worship night on Thursday night. Then 10 days later comes Pentecost, which is May 28th, next week, and we're gonna celebrate in a really awesome time. So that's Memorial Day weekend. I know that uh, maybe you thought you had different plans, but I just gave you your most important plan, okay? Come to church, if you've never been baptized, great week to get baptized, don't wait around anymore, scan the QR code. Uh, but all of us, let's be here and let's celebrate what God is doing here in the lives of people. Uh, if you are wondering, hey, what's my next step? You know, you're on this journey with Jesus, and it's, sometimes it's difficult to find what that next step is. We've got a class for you, no matter if you are new to the journey, no matter if you're way down and you're doing things, maybe you just kind of feel stuck and you're like, I don't know what to do next. Uh, we have a class called Trailhead that is on June 4th and June 11th. We provide lunch and childcare. It's right after this service upstairs. And uh, what we would love is to have you be a part of it. We had 30 people go through our first trailhead last week or last month, and uh, it was amazing. We'll have a, a, a testimony about that that you'll see on social media. But here's, here's the whole thing about what trailhead is. What we do is we share some simple tools that you can take, and I promise you this, what God does with this class is amazing. And it's so cool to watch the Holy Spirit work and show people what their next step is. 
And uh, I would just encourage you, no matter where you are in your journey, if you've never taken it, sign up, be a part of it. Whether you've been coming here a long time or you're just starting out, this is the place to go. It's the place you get on the trail, right? The trailhead. Yeah, there's a few of those around here. So do that. Uh, Also, this week and next week, we are doing our underwear drive. So we do this every year where we collect new underwear, not used, okay, Uh, new underwear to help stock the supply for Milford Miami Ministries. Uh, To do all that, I asked like what we call their underwear section in first service, and they told me that it's called a pantry, and I think that's a little weird. I don't, I don't keep my underwear in the pantry. Don't know if you guys do, uh, but no, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. I don't keep my underwear in the pantry, but whatever they call it, that's fine. If they call it a pantry, that's great. But here's the whole point. We want to overwhelm them with underwear. So go buy some new underwear. You say, what size should I get? Buy the size you wear, okay? And then maybe grab another size and you can bring it. There's a red box in the lobby where you can drop that off. But next Sunday, is the last day to be able to do that. So come prepared next week uh, to give some underwear to help us do that. Uh, well, today, this afternoon at four o'clock, there is a, an event going on, put on by our children's ministry, uh, called Baby Dedication. And so we've got these families that are coming, and you'll see some pictures on the screen behind me of the families that are signed up to bring their children um, to dedicate them to the Lord. And I know you won't listen to me, you see cute kids, I know, it's fine. But this is such an important event. And so we do this separate because it's such a big deal and we love to do this, but we think it's great in our service to also show you who the people are and we're gonna take a moment to pray for these families and what they're doing when they dedicate their babies, their children to the Lord, is they're saying we are committing to raising our child in the way of Jesus. And so what we do as a church is we partner with them and say we wanna help you with this. So not just to dedicate your child, but to provide programming and provide help and to partner with you as you raise your kids to know Jesus, to love Jesus, and to eventually, hopefully, be saved by the grace of Jesus and the forgiveness for their sins. And so uh, it's happening at four o'clock. Shannon and Sarah do an unbelievable job with that. So you can be praying for that. I'm sure we'll see some more pictures on social media later. Um, But these are all the people that are coming to do that. And so what I wanna do is I wanna pray. If you still wanna look at cute pictures of kids on the screen while I pray, it's okay. You're forgiven for having your eyes open. All right, but let me pray for them. Father in heaven, we pray for all of these families today that will be coming to dedicate their children to you. Uh, Lord, what an amazing uh, decision and commitment by these families to say, we wanna raise our kids to know Jesus. And so we're gonna dedicate them from birth, just like Samuel was dedicated, that Lord, they're your kids. And God, I pray for us as a church, as we partner with parents to raise these children under your teaching, Lord, will help them to, to learn about you, help them to learn to love you. And God, Lord, we pray for the day and we look forward to the day that they will give their life to you and be saved. And so God, we pray that uh, you would bless today at four o'clock when they all come. Let it be just a special time for their families as they dedicate their children. And Lord, we pray for us that as we study your word and we open up your your, your, your scriptures today, uh, we pray that your spirit would be alive and active in this room and in each and every one of us as we open up your word together. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Acts chapter one. Uh, and we're gonna read there in just a moment, but we've been on this journey, 40 days with Jesus, From Easter all the way till Thursday night, we had this big worship night on Thursday night. It was awesome. There was many of you that were here. It was a great night where we celebrated the night that Jesus ascended into heaven. And then from the ascension to Pentecost, there's 10 days. So Pentecost literally means 50 days after Passover, the penta part of that, you should be able to notice, 50. And so what we are in is this time where Jesus told his disciples to wait. 
And it makes us ask the question of ourselves, what do we do while we wait? What do we do while we wait for God to move? What is our responsibility? How do we find ourselves in this? And so what I wanna do is I wanna read the text, all of Acts chapter one, one through 11, and um, you can read along with this, or you can open up the Bible on your uh, app, or if you have a paper Bible, you can use that as well. But here's what he says, in my first book, O Theophilus, this is Luke writing, the same Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke, his former book was that Gospel, now he's writing the book of Acts. He says, in my former book, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day he was taken up, the ascension, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that your father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, saying, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The disciples are standing there going, what do we do now? Well, Jesus had already told them. He told them to go to Jerusalem and to wait. Gave them clear commands, which we'll see as we study through this today. But again, it makes us ask the question, what happens while we wait? What are we called to do when these waiting seasons happen? Well, I think that leads to an even greater question. What is most important for us to do in life? Like, how do I live my life in a way that really matters? Another way that you could say it is, how do I achieve significance? This is what we want, right? Like, we want some kind of significance in life. It's what leads middle school students to, like, determine which way they're going to go in life. Like, what do you want to be known for? Do I want to be an athlete? Do I want to be a musician? Do I want to be the funny guy? Like when you're in high school, college age, determining what, what path you want to take, what I want to do for a living. Uh, do I want to go to college? Do I want to just pick up a trade? All of those things. Like you search for significance in what I do. It's what leads adults to think that somehow climbing the corporate ladder and getting all the way to the top is going to give them significance. Or if I have this many zeros in my net worth, then it gives me significance. If I marry these people, if I have kids, if I buy this house in that neighborhood, if I get a bigger boat than my friends, this gives me significance. At least that's what we think. I don't know if any of you remember the movie Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck. Anybody remember that movie? Okay, a few of you. It wasn't like the best movie of all time by any stretch. It's probably not in anyone's top five. But there is a scene that's pretty powerful in that film. When the, the, the British army <clears throat> are being bombed by Nazi air raids. They're downtrodden, they needed all the help they could get, and an American pilot, a lieutenant, comes over to join forces with the British Royal Air Force. Just an attempt to help Britain regain control of the situation. So in spite of the devastation and risk, he's eager, eager to help. He reports to the captain, and the captain wants him to get settled in, takes his belongings to his barracks. He says, why don't you go take all this over here, and then we'll, you know, we'll kind of reassess. And at that same time, a British officer runs up to the captain, and he screams, two didn't make it back. I only counted 11. 
And the American pilot interrupts him and says, you know what, maybe I should just skip the housekeeping and putting my stuff away and let me just go jump in my plane right now. The British captain looked at the lieutenant He said to him, are all you Americans this anxious to get yourselves killed? And the lieutenant boldly replied, no sir, not anxious to die, just anxious to matter. Searching for significance. Where do we find out what really matters in life? I don't know about you, but I want to do something that matters. I want to do something significant with the time that God's given me on this earth. You know, some people spend their whole life searching for true significance. You watch famous athletes play past their prime to try to catch that that elusive ring or championship. You watch people give everything they can to to go and pursue some business venture to, to somehow get success. You watch people do the craziest things searching for significance. But what I want us to do today is I want us to go to John chapter 12. If you had your, if you were holding your, your place there, we're gonna go there in just a second. And this is a little bit of an unlikely place to study. It's kind of that transition piece. Like if you watch a season of a TV show and you know they get some of those episodes where you're like, nothing really happens. All it's doing is building a story, a storyline for the next episode. This is what this passage kind of of feels like. But my hope is by the end of our time studying it, you will see how you truly live a life of significance. So John chapter 12, starting in verse Nine. We find the text, it says, when a large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, the context of this passage is the first eight verses of John 12 are Jesus is at Lazarus' house. Remember, Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary has just anointed Jesus with this very expensive perfume. John tells us it's worth a year's worth of wages. This was a family heirloom that was probably passed down through generations. Mary breaks it open, pours it at Jesus' feet. It's a powerful, powerful illustration of extravagant love. And so they're in Bethany. They're in their hometown And now this large crowd learns that Jesus was there. But notice this phrase, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus. So how can you live a life of significance? Here's point number one. When you point people to Jesus. Watch what happens in the text. Verse 10 says, so the chief priests make plans to put Lazarus to death as well, which You think of this, I look at this, I'm like, what a great idea, right? Like your problem was, this guy was dead, Jesus raised him to life, so how do you fix the problem? Oh, well, let's kill him. Like, 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 yeah, I mean, this guy has a habit of not staying dead, let's just make him dead again, that's gonna fix it. It Says verse 11, because on account of him, on the account of Lazarus, Many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Lazarus' significance came from the fact, not that he was raised from the dead, but that he used what Jesus had done in his life to point other people to Jesus. Lazarus was not some act at a circus where you come in the tent and someone's going, hey, come see the man who was dead and who's now alive. He wasn't some spectacular that you come and pay tickets for. No, Lazarus was a man who used what God had done for him to say, don't look at me, look at what he's done. He's got the power. So how can you point people to Jesus? Four quick things. The first one is to serve his church. You want to point people to Jesus, I'm telling you, join a serving team and start serving. 
You will never understand all of the spiritual blessings that you have in Christ until you start serving somewhere, anywhere, but serve. Why? Because it changes your perspective. When church becomes this spectator sport, where you come and feel like you're just at a show or you're at, a, at an event where all I'm doing is taking in, you've missed the point. You weren't created to just consume, you were created to contribute. God gave you spiritual gifts. It says that upon your salvation, you were given gifts for use in the body. And so imagine if church wasn't just a place you attended to hear, but church was a people that you were a part of, that you serve one another, you love one another, you pray for one another, you carry each other's burdens, you encourage one another, and lift each other up. I'm telling you, there are so many ways that your life will be better when you start serving his church. The second way you can point people to Jesus is you, you live in community. Christianity is not a solo sport. You don't just go out and do it on your own. There's a reason why Solomon says in Proverbs 17 that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Listen, you can't sharpen yourself. You need to live in community with other people that are going to sharpen you and make you better. You were created to be with other people. And Satan loves to convince us that we can do this all on our own. But you want to point people to Jesus, join a group, join a serving team, get involved with other people, start a group, do whatever you need to do, but surround yourself with a group of people that are headed in Jesus' direction and watch how you sharpen each other and you start pointing people to Jesus. The third way is to reach out to those who are around you. What I love about this text is that Lazarus didn't go on a mission trip to go and reach people for Jesus. Now, are mission trips important? Absolutely, I love missions. I've taken many mission trips. I'm on a board of a mission in Mexico. I love mission work. Don't, don't mistake that. But so many times we get this idea in our head when we think about the Great Commission, like Adam talked about last week, as being something that you go and do somewhere else. But that's not even what the original text says in Matthew 28. It literally says, as you go, so this is you living your normal life, you are making disciples, you're baptizing, you're teaching everyone to obey what Jesus says. What Lazarus does is he's in his hometown, he's in Bethany. Better yet, he's most likely at his own house. And he's reaching out to the people around him. Who's in your circle that needs to be pointed to Jesus? Fourth area is to share your story. Your story has so much power. And yet, you know how many of us are convinced that our story isn't as great as someone else's? Well, you know, if I had their story, I'd share it. No, you missed the point. Your story is powerful. Your story can open up the door to where God's story can change someone's life. There's power in your story. Share it with someone. Share what God has done. Share about, man, you don't know what I used to be like, but then Jesus stepped in, and now look at my life. It's completely different. It's easy. You know, one of the greatest compliments I used to receive was I, I worked for 16 years in my hometown where I graduated from high school. And I used to love seeing people I knew from high school and the first thing, they would always say two things. The first thing would be like, Matt, you put on some weight since high school. I'm like, yeah, thanks for that. You know, glad you noticed. Um, that part I wasn't proud of. But the second part would be like, man, what are you up to these days? And I'd tell them, well, I'm a preacher. I work at a church. And they'd go, man, I, I would have never guessed. I had no idea. That's, that's great. Why? Because they see what Jesus has done in my life. You know what's amazing to me about Lazarus? 
It says many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. It reminds me of what it says about John the Baptist in John 1.37 where it says they heard John but they followed Jesus. When you make your story, your testimony, and you give all the glory to yourself or your past of all the wrong things you used to do, you missed, you missed your testimony. Everything points to Jesus. And so our passage continues and it goes into a story that we all know, the, the story of the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. We're just gonna kind of read through it because we have to read it to get to the next part, but we're not gonna spend time unpacking this. But in John 12, verse 12, it says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast, that's the feast of the Passover, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it was written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your donkey is coming on a, on a don or excuse me, your, not your donkey is coming, your king is coming, that's bad, sitting on a donkey's colt. So how do you live a life of significance? The first one we already saw. When you point people to Jesus, here's number two, when you trust God no matter what. Now here's why we had to read that passage. Verse 16, look what happens. His disciples did not understand these things at first. You ever have a time like this? That something's going on in your life and you're like, I have no idea what you're doing, God. Why'd this happen? Why is this going on? Like you're, you're in the middle of it and you're like, I don't understand what's happening. We can all relate with this. At some point in your life, you're gonna have a time when you're like, you know what? I don't fully understand everything that's going on because there's times when you don't understand at first and you kind of feel like God has removed himself from the situation. Sometimes it's even hard to find where God is in this situation, and you're like, God, why aren't you speaking? God, where are you moving? What's happening? And I just wanna tell you, don't confuse God's silence with God's absence. Don't think that just because you're not hearing from God in a moment means that God has moved away. He hasn't. And here's the disciples, they didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, after he was crucified and rose from the dead, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. It was after the fact that they remembered. They didn't get it at the time. They were just caught up in the parade. Everybody's grabbing palm branches and going, Hosanna, blessed is he. And you can see all of the disciples, they're like, oh, let's go. They start grabbing palm branches and they're just having fun. This is just a parade, here we go. They're just enjoying it. Having no idea the significance of the moment. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times when what God is doing in the present doesn't make sense. But then there will come a moment later on down the road when you look back and you go, oh, that's what God was doing. And I don't know who the first preacher was to say this. I've heard many of them say it since, but I love this phrase, that waiting time is not wasted time. There are a lot of people who think that when you're told to wait, that, oh, well, it's just the end of the world. Like, anybody have kids? Okay, anybody that has children, you know that when you make your kids wait, it's like the end of the world, right? Like, well, you're gonna have to wait. And they're like, ah, oh, this, is, this is terrible. You're the worst parents ever. We do the same thing with God, right? So let's go back to the disciples. Jesus ascends into heaven, and they are in this middle of waiting. Middle of the season. Now, we know that it took 10 days, but they didn't know that. Jesus had just told them not long from now, and not too many days, the Holy Spirit will come. But they just had to wait. And God was not wasting their time. He was actually using it to refine them. 
you think of Mary, nine months, you're gonna be found with child and then she finally gives birth. That nine months was not just to prepare Jesus in her womb. That nine months was used to prepare her. And yeah, it was waiting, but God had some work to do on Mary. You think of Joseph. Joseph's in a prison, not, not Joseph, Mary's husband. Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph is in this prison. He'd been sold into slavery by his brothers. You know that whole story. He thinks that he's finally made it. He's in Egypt. He gets thrown in prison. <clears throat> and the Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and baker get thrown into prison. They make him mad. They get down there. They both have a dream one night. Joseph interprets a dream. And they're like, oh, we gotta go tell the Pharaoh. They, they do that, and Joseph says, hey, 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 guys, before you go, one thing that I would ask of you, when you get before Pharaoh, remember me. And guess what? They go before Pharaoh, and they forgot. And Joseph stayed in prison for 14 more years, waiting. And then in God's time, Pharaoh has a dream and the cupbearer goes, wait, there's a guy that maybe he's still around that can interpret dreams. And God elevates Joseph to be the second in charge of the entire nation of Egypt. He ends up saving the entire nation of Israel all because of Joseph being willing to not waste his waiting season. Now, I hope that your waiting season is 10 days, not 14 years. But will you be willing to trust God no matter what? You wanna live a life of significance? That's how it happens. Verse 17 says, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. They continued to tell all about this. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he'd done this sign, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. The world has gone after him. Here's number three. How do you live a life of significance when you make less of you and you make more of Jesus? We've talked a lot about Lazarus. I wanna show you two other people, two of the disciples that we'll read about starting in verse 20. It says, now among those who came up to worship at the feast, again, the feast of Passover, it's the same day, were some Greeks, some foreigners. We talked about Jews already. Now the Greeks are coming in. So they came to Philip, one of the disciples, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. The reason they came to him is he was a foreigner as well. He wasn't a Jew. And asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and he told Andrew, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Philip and Andrew, what's interesting about Andrew specifically, we don't know a ton about Philip either, but Andrew shows up three times in the Gospels. One of them is here. A second time is at the feeding of the 5,000, when Andrew is the one that finds the little boy with five loaves and two fish, and he brings him to Jesus. And then the other time is when the little children are coming to Jesus and all the other disciples are holding him back and being like, whatever. Andrew's the one that brings the little children to Jesus. The only thing we know about Andrew in the Gospels is that he brought people to Jesus. How cool is that? Like if you're gonna be known for something, not a bad thing to be known for. Did Andrew do other stuff? I'm sure he did. But here we find him yet again saying, more of you, less of me. I don't need to be known for anything except that I brought people to you. Story, or the text goes on in verse 24, truly, truly, this is Jesus speaking, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now Jesus is obviously using this imagery to describe what's about to happen to him. 
He's about to be crucified and die. He's about to be buried, planted like a seed. And then he's going to raise to new life, which will be bearing much fruit. The church would bear much fruit because of Jesus' resurrection. But could you imagine what it would be like for Lazarus to be in this group and to hear that? That if it dies, it bears much fruit. Lazarus knew that personally. Lazarus knew that literally. That his death and being raised to life by Jesus is what gave him the ability to bear much fruit. We would know nothing about Lazarus if it wasn't for what Jesus did in his life. Now I know there's a temptation when you hear stuff like that to go, well, I mean, Matt, if I was dead and Jesus raised me back to life, like, yeah, I would tell that story. That's a pretty good story to tell, right? Well, not to over-spiritualize it, but you remember what Paul says? All of us, we're dead in our transgressions and sin, but God made us alive with Christ. You have that death to life story. It might not be physical death to life, but it, it sure is, I almost went somewhere I shouldn't have. It sure is a spiritual death to life story, and it's a great story to tell. John 3.30 John the Baptist said these words. He says, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. You wanna live a life of significance, you make more of Jesus and less of you. Number four, how do you live a life of significance when you prioritize the right things? In verse 25, it says, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, this type of language is something that doesn't translate real well in our culture, right? Like this idea of hating your life is not something that we understand in the way that Jesus meant it. Jesus used this type of language to describe when somebody uh, loves something more than something else. So you have a, a, a person that comes up and wants to be a disciple of Jesus in another passage in Matthew where he says, I, I want to follow you, um, but let me go bury my, my father first. And Jesus says, unless you hate your father and mother, you cannot be my disciple. Now, is Jesus telling everybody, hey, go hate your father and mother if you want to follow me, hate your mom and dad? If that's what Jesus was saying, that was like every teenager's life verse, Right? Like, okay, let me tattoo that one on my arm. I can hate my mom and dad. Like, that's not what Jesus is saying. He actually has in a parallel passage where he says, you should love me more than your mother and father. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, compared to your love for me, your love for things that really matter, this relationship almost looks like hatred. And so in our text, Whoever loves his life, whoever loves this life, this world, you're gonna lose it. The person that's searching for significance in things that only this world can do for you, it's not gonna last. First John 2 says the world and its desires are gonna pass away. Don't love the world. But whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. When you love what really matters, when you search for significance and things that really matter, when you prioritize the right things and say, Jesus, I'm giving myself to you, you will keep that for eternal life. And I promise you, it's way more important than anything that you have in this life. Jesus goes on, he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also, talking about when I go to heaven, I'm gonna bring you with us, with me, if you follow me and you serve me. If anyone serves me, the Father will, what? Honor him. You know another way to say that? The Father will give him significance. 
You serve him, you follow him, you're gonna have significance that this world can't even come close to understand. Jesus understood this better than anyone. He says in Matthew 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You see, Jesus lived this out. Paul says in Philippians chapter two that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen, when you and I humble ourselves, God does all the honoring, all the exalting for us. But when we wanna exalt ourselves, this world is gonna humble you. The next passage following this in John chapter 12, Jesus really starts to be very clear about what's about to happen. He's talking about his death that's coming, his crucifixion. And he uses this phrase in John 12, verse 32, where he says, and when I am lifted up, talking about the cross, I will draw all people to myself. You wanna live a life of significance? You lift up Jesus and watch what he does. You know, we've been on this journey for quite some time, right? 40 days, ascension happens, and now we're however many days later, four or five, I can't count, but here we are in the middle of it. We're awaiting Pentecost. What was it like for the disciples? They went down from the Mount of Olives after Jesus ascended into heaven, They crossed the Kidron Valley. They went into the upper room. And they did two things that Jesus told them to do while they wait. And I think that these two things are pretty good things for us too. He says to pray and to fast. The first one's to pray. This is the most important thing that they are called to do. You say, well, Matt, what were they praying for? They were praying for boldness. They were praying for God to move. They were praying for the promise to come, that the Holy Spirit would come. This is the amazing part. They spent 10 days without Jesus and without the Holy Spirit. You and I never have to do that. We have the Holy Spirit. He's here. He's alive and active. He's living in everyone who believes. So we never encountered what the disciples had to encounter for 10 days. But they're there and they're going, what do we do here? They're praying, God send your spirit. Jesus had promised it, but they hadn't received it. And so they're praying. Prayer should be the first thing we do, not the last thing. You know, isn't it interesting when someone going through a tough time, you wanna think of everything else that you can do. I'll bring you a meal, I'll do this other stuff, which all that's good. But we use a phrase like, you know, I wish there was more I could do for you, but I'll pray for you. Like that's the least you can do. No, prayer is the most you can do. So you pray, and then he tells them to fast. And I know this is something that like we don't talk about a lot, um, Fasting is one of those things that you're going, well, I mean, what's it for? What do we do? How does this happen? Uh, Fasting, real simply, is that you are starving yourself of a desire of your flesh so that you could create a hunger for something of God. So I'm starving myself, most of the time, biblically, it's about food, right? So we're fasting for a certain number of days. The disciples would have been fasting for 10 days. They would have committed themselves to this. I'm not saying that any of you 
have to like go all out and fast for the next seven days. If you chose to, that's great. But if you've never fasted before, that's a pretty big lift. That's gonna be a lot for you. Uh, but I was in, I was, when I was in college, I had a mentor who um, he didn't like to tell anyone about this because you know Jesus says in Matthew 6 that you don't tell people about when you're fasting, that you're not doing it for anyone else. This is between you and the Lord. And so he was nervous to even tell me, but we met on Wednesdays and like eventually we were trying to do lunch one Wednesday and he's like, I don't tell people this, but Wednesday is my day to fast every week. He goes, I know I don't tell people because it kind of sounds like a Pharisee thing, but here's what I noticed. I noticed that every time my body, my flesh, told me I was hungry, I would go eat. Every time my flesh or my body told me I was thirsty, I would go get something to drink. And so I set apart one day every week, that no one else notices, to say, flesh, you're not in charge, but the spirit inside of me is. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know if it's food, I don't know if it's TV, I don't know if it's social media or what, but what I would challenge you to do, what I think would be great for all of us to be doing, is while we wait for Pentecost, one week, seven days from today, what is it that you could say, you know what, God, I'm gonna starve myself of this? One meal a day, a couple hours, whatever it takes, and create a hunger for the things of God. What if all of us would pray and fast till Pentecost? You know what I believe would happen? I believe we'd see God move in a powerful way. You know, there is no movement of God that I can find evidence for that didn't first start with a group of people committed to prayer and fasting. So why not let that be us? It's worth it. What do you do while you wait? How do you find significance? You lift Jesus up. What better way to do that than all of us committing in your own way, you don't have to tell me to pray and fast and watch what God does. Let me pray for us and then we'll move into a time of communion. Father in heaven, we come to you today praying that you would help us to find our significance in life in you, that you are truly the only one who can even offer it to us. And so God, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice, whether that's here, in person, or online listening, that God, you would stir something in their heart through your spirit for them to take a step, to be willing to try something that maybe they've never tried before and to fast from something for the next seven days and say, God, I wanna, I wanna follow you. I wanna give this to you. You are more worth it to me than whatever it is that we choose to fast from. And God, we believe that not just that you can move, but Lord, we believe that you will move. And so Lord, we pray that you would do more than we can ask, think, or imagine according to your power at work in your church. Lord, we believe in you today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 53 says, verse four says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. The weight that he bore, the sin that he carried upon his shoulders for us, for you, for me. The death that he, that he took upon himself, that is what, where we find our healing. That's one of my favorite verses where it says, and by his wounds we are healed. So we wanna take some time 
um, individually um, taking communion, remembering the sacrifice that he made, but also celebrating the victory that we have through his blood, the victory that we have in his resurrection. So take a few moments and spend some time with him this morning. The God I serve knows only how to triumph, and my God will never fail. No, my God will never fail, and I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory for the
in this time of, we're going to have a baptism, is what I'm trying to say. I'm just excited. So go ahead and have a seat and watch the screens, and let's share in this together. Hey guys, we have Zoe here. She's in our middle school ministry, and she's made the decision to be ba baptized. Let's make some noise, church. <laughs> Woo! Zoe, I have two questions for you. Do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Awesome. You also believe Jesus died, buried, and resurrected? Amen. Awesome. Cross your arms, plug your nose. It's a privilege and honor to baptize you into Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to new life. Woo! Well, we celebrate that baptism today. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to close with a word of prayer. So go ahead and stand to your feet, and we're going to pray together. If you need prayer after we're done, stay in your seats, and we have prayer partners that can come and see you. Uh, but let's close in prayer. God, we thank you today for your presence in this place. We thank you for challenging us for something more. We know that you want to work in our lives, God. And so we stand here with open hands, open hearts, ready and willing to do the things that we need to do to answer your calling. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>